Nietzsche's proclamation of the death of God marks the beginning of the modern age, the age in which science and technology have largely replaced religion as the bodies of knowledge and the activities that society depends on and lives by. At least one traditional understanding of what God means was at an end. Yet the theme wasn't novel. As we've seen, it's been building up for centuries. Even as far back as Galileo, the idea was already coming in that the way the world works is neither moral nor purposive, but simply mechanical. A mechanical universe no longer reveals any guiding hand at work in it. So the new secular scientific worldview cannot give the old kind of support to religious belief. It seems that faith must be separated from cosmology, our theory of the world, and become more inward and ethical. As we've seen in this series, many Christian thinkers have been attempting just that. Pascal turned away from the objective God of the philosophers and sought a new way to a hidden God known by the heart. Kierkegaard sought to keep God's transcendence but within the sphere of the spiritual life. Jung's God was an image buried deep in the psyche of the whole self that we are to become. Albert Schweitzer's God was an ethical inspiration, the ground of the will to love. These thinkers were moving away from the old cosmic, literal theism. Instead, they saw God as hidden in the heart, by which they meant, perhaps, as the soul's guiding ideal. A new idea of God has been slowly taking shape, but perhaps nobody yet had managed to spell it out entirely satisfactorily. Well, we've one more thinker still to meet, as remarkable a character as perhaps anyone else in this series. In the autumn of 1908, he came here to Manchester University's Aeronautical Engineering Laboratory. He was 19 years old, and his name was Ludwig Wittgenstein. He was an impulsive, sociable character, at that time still very well to do. He was highly musical. He made many friends. But he didn't have much to say about his exotic background. Wittgenstein was a product of Vienna in the last days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. His father was its leading steel magnate. The nine talented children grew up in surroundings of the utmost opulence. But they belonged to a new generation which rejected this high bourgeois culture, preferring modernism in art, puritanism in morals, and truth and simplicity in all things. This outlook shows in Wittgenstein's early choice of engineering as an honest profession. In Manchester, he designed and then began to build a jet reaction engine that would deliver the thrust at the tip of the blades. Over 30 years later, aircraft such as the Fairy Gyrodyne were built on this principle. But 1910 was too early, and in any case, Wittgenstein's life was about to change. To design his propeller, he needed mathematics. Now, any ordinary mathematician just does mathematics, but Wittgenstein asked himself the fatal question, what is mathematics? Why is it so powerful? And what are numbers? Wittgenstein was the sort of man who quite unselfconsciously goes straight to the top. By the autumn of 1911, he'd found out who was the best philosopher of mathematics alive. And he simply presented himself as a student to Bertrand Russell at Cambridge. He was queer, and his notions seemed to me odd. He came to me and said, Will you please tell me whether I am a complete idiot or not. Because if I am a complete idiot, I shall become an aeronaut. But if not, I shall become a philosopher. I told him to write me something during the vacation on some philosophical subject. After reading only one sentence, I said to him, No, you must not become an aeronaut. Although Wittgenstein spent so many years in Cambridge, he was never at ease with the clannish, ritualistic and enclosed side of academic life. In fact, he thought it corrupt and much preferred the town to the gown. 
Like Nietzsche, he had a great need for freedom. He never married nor owned a house. He liked to live in digs, which he kept changing, and he frequently vanished altogether. When war broke out, he volunteered for the Austrian army. Now I should have the chance to be a decent human being, for I'm standing eye to eye with death. May the spirit bring me light. Understand people. Whenever you feel like hating them, try instead to understand them. Be at peace within yourself. But how do you find this peace in yourself? Only if I live in a way pleasing to God. Only so can one bear life. The war destroyed the world Wittgenstein had grown up in. His life changed. He gave away his money and became a country school teacher in Austria. At the same time, he published the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. This famous book is the last great attempt to defend the traditional view that language can copy reality precisely and completely. What can be said, can be said clearly. What cannot be said clearly is not in the world, and one must be silent about it. When a few years later Wittgenstein designed and built this house for his sister, he gave his teaching visible form. Wittgenstein's approach to architecture was stringently functional. Everything had to be redesigned for the utmost simplicity, right down to this window latch, then precision engineered. And the result is not inhuman. Windows and doors match the shape of the human body. They're double for silence and insulation, and there are heating grills below them. The whole thing is exact and spare and sublime, like Wittgenstein's philosophy. And as with his philosophy, What's left out is even more important than what's left in. The sense of the world must lie outside the world. In the world, everything is as it is, and everything happens as it does happen. In it, no value exists. God does not reveal himself in the world, feeling the world as a limited whole. It is this that is mystical. What did Wittgenstein mean by God in his early philosophy? The house gives a clue. After a while, the geometrical tranquility of this place begins to remind us of a mosque, a place where God is so exalted and transcendent that no image at all is possible. Can you imagine an idea of God so exalted that the sense of the presence of God and the sense of the absence of God coincide. Or put it another way, by its extreme rigor, the house creates a sense, it gives a hint of an absolute standard of purity by which human life should be guided and assessed. Wittgenstein once said he liked the idea of a silent religion. Silence tells no lies. Silence does not deceive. We feel that even when all possible scientific questions have been answered, the problems of life remain completely untouched. Of course, there are then no questions left, and this itself is the answer. The solution of the problem of life is seen in the vanishing of the problem. What we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence. In 1929, 40 years old now, Wittgenstein unexpectedly reappeared in Cambridge after a 16-year absence and soon began teaching. From 1933, word went round that in his classes in Trinity College, he was developing an entirely new philosophy. The classes were held in this room at the head of K Staircase in Hewell's Court. By the window, his writing table. The shoe boxes in which his notes were stored and the deck chair in which he habitually sat. The austerity and bareness of the room, 
which was his own living room as well as his teaching room, reflects his Tolstoyan personality and style of life. As each student arrived, he or she collected a wooden folding chair from the landing outside. It was unwise to be late. The class met twice a week for a gruelling two-hour session. We know Wittgenstein planned these sessions carefully because the published student's notes of them tally with his own unpublished manuscripts. But during the class, Wittgenstein thought aloud and occasionally terrified the students by questioning them. What is philosophy? Here's an example. Every day we ask each other the time and answer without any hesitation. But suppose one day we ask ourselves, what is time? Now we suddenly seem to be landed with a genuine classical philosophical problem, a very difficult one. Wittgenstein says that these problems arise through a disease of language. A myth has held us captive. We're caught up in the idea that words are names and that the meaning of a word is the thing that it stands for. And then we start investigating what that thing can possibly be. Wittgenstein had himself held such a view, but now he was trying to shake it off. Instead, he asks us to see words as doing jobs. Words are tools of many different kinds. Words are like chess pieces. The meaning of a piece is its powers, the part it can play in furthering the game. Well, all language is like that. We play games with language. Our language is a function of the way we live. It's a tool of social interaction. Now, this may sound rather abstract, but in fact, it changes everything. The old theory of meaning summoned up great nebulous abstractions which philosophers then worried about. But Wittgenstein's new point of view is strictly practical. Look at the grammar, he says. Look at the way the language works. If only you can see that clearly, you'll see all there is to see. Look at the grammar of ethical terms, and such terms as God, soul, mind. One of the chief troubles is that we take a substantive to correspond to a thing. The words soul and mind have been used as though they stood for a thing, a gaseous thing. What is the soul is a misleading question. Look at the grammar of ethical terms, and such terms as God, soul, mind. One of the chief troubles is that we take a substantive to correspond to a thing. The words soul and mind have been used as though they stood for a thing, a gaseous thing. What is the soul is a misleading question. So what will become of morality and religion on this new point of view? I think you can guess. Wittgenstein has a deep respect for the practice of morality and religion, but like Tolstoy, he's deeply mistrustful of the theory. On the whole, he thinks of religious beliefs not as being factual, but rather in terms of the job they do in shaping our lives. Until recently, not much more was known than that. But now, a lot of fragments of Wittgenstein's observations and his private notes on religion have come to light. They show how deeply his thought about religion was embedded in everyday life. One of my pupils, on my advice, has gone to work at Woolworths. Now that is the sort of thing you should do. Try and get a job in some large store where you will meet ordinary people. What is the use of studying philosophy if all that it does for you is to enable you to talk with some plausibility about some abstruse questions of logic, etc., and if it does not improve your thinking about the important questions of everyday life? It is, if possible, still more difficult to think really honestly about your life and other people's lives. And the trouble is that thinking about these things is not thrilling, but downright nasty. God grant the philosopher insight into what lies in front of everyone's eyes. Not how the world is, is the mystical, but that it is. 
to renounce the pomps and vanities of this wicked world. Just think what that would really involve. Who of us today even thinks of doing such a thing? We all want to be admired. St. Paul said, I die daily. Just think what that must have meant. For all you and I can tell, the religion of the future will be without any priests or ministers. I think one of the things you and I have to learn is that we have to live without the consolation of belonging to a church. Christianity is not a doctrine, not, I mean, a theory about what has happened or will happen to the human soul, but a description of something that actually takes place in human life. For consciousness of sin is a real event, and so are despair and salvation through faith. Perhaps we can say, only love can believe the resurrection. This can come about only if you no longer rest your weight on the earth, but suspend yourself from heaven. Then everything will be different, and it will be no wonder if you can do things that you cannot do now. A man who is suspended looks the same as one who is standing, but the interplay of forces within him is nevertheless quite different, so that he can act quite differently than can a standing man. An honest religious thinker is like a tightrope walker. He almost looks as though he were walking on nothing but air. His support is the slenderest imaginable, and yet it really is possible to walk on it. When in 1949 Wittgenstein learnt that he was fatally ill with cancer, he told his doctor that he did not want to die in hospital. His doctor offered a room in his own home when it should become necessary. Over a year went by, and then a few months before his death, Wittgenstein arrived to take up residence in this room. Here, he continued working until two days before the end. Wittgenstein, like Nietzsche, was a solitary, passionate and compelling figure. Both of them were tormented by the ultimate questions of life. Nietzsche broke his mind trying to force a new way through them. Wittgenstein took a different route. He sought a cure. Thirty years before, he'd written that the answer to the riddle of life lies in the disappearance of the question. So he patiently unravels our illusions and forces us to return to the ethical reality of the everyday. When we see that our common life is all that realization is religion. Wittgenstein's point of view is very down to earth and very agnostic. All we can see clearly is the way our language works in the games we play. So we can see how belief in God works and how it ought to shape our lives. But then we must stop at that. To this day, many people find this new point of view unnerving. Wittgenstein's so clear that belief in God requires conversion of life, truthfulness, inner integrity. He's equally clear that that's all there is to be said. We must be cured of the old speculative metaphysical impulse. So what would you call him? Would you say this is religious agnosticism? Or a mysticism of the everyday? Or simply that it is and always was just the truth of the matter? What have you made of the story we've been telling in this series about how the modern crisis of faith developed? Science first mechanized nature and then embedded us in it. Biblical criticism demythologized the Bible. Radical humanism argued that the only world that can possibly be for us is our own human world. And then the study of other religions suggested that no one religion, 
not even Christianity, is likely to be absolute. Finally, we came to our fluid, uncertain, modern world where there are as many points of view as there are people, and there seems to be no centre anymore, no absolute standard or reference point. Now, to many people, this must seem the story of a long decline, a sea of faith, the tide going right out. As they see it, any faith or philosophy of life must start from a set of big, reassuring answers to the big questions. That's the basis. And when those answers and even the questions begin to look rather shaky, people feel that religion's becoming impossible. I don't agree. Skepticism, as well as certainty, can drive you to faith. We saw that as far back as Pascal. Only it leads you to see religion in a different way, not as a set of grand answers, but simply as a spiritual path. When I look into the void of the modern situation and I see that it's entirely up to me what I'm to make of myself and my life, then I find I need religion to give me a path, to give my soul shape, to give me categories to live by, goals to pursue. I'm a priest in the Church of England, and I practice in a rather traditional way. But when I say the creed, I regard it not as giving me supernatural information, but as showing me a way to walk in. You may not agree, but in a way that's only to be expected. For our whole message has been that in the modern situation, the individual stands absolutely alone with his freedom before the ultimate questions of life. You must decide. We finish now. It's over to you. 2025, take eight on the end.